Welcome to the Attention Deficit Disorder Expert Podcast Series by Attitude Magazine. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Susan Kaufman for Attitude Magazine. This is our fourth of a series of webinars that we are holding in support of ADHD Awareness Month. Um, we are very pleased to have Dr. William Dodson with us today. Dr. Dodson is a board-certified psychiatrist who, for almost 25 years, has been in practice in Colorado um, with a focus on attention deficit disorder, and he's graciously agreed to answer questions on the subject of ADHD medications, which is a subject about which, um, of course, there's much interest. One disclaimer, of course, as always with Attitude, we don't offer medical advice. We do give medical information about the topic of attention deficit disorder, but we um, urge you to see a medical practitioner for problems specific to you. And with that, I'd like to um, ask Dr. Dodson to give us maybe a preliminary overview on what are ADHD medications, what is what kind of class of medication is this, and what's the general sort of how are they generally considered before we go to the specifics. Thank you very much, Susan, and thank you all for coming back. Just to start about general notions about ADHD medications, uh, the scientific world sees ADHD medications as the treatment of choice. Internationally, there are eight different standards of care, uh, two in the United States, one in Canada, etc. All of them agree, however, that the stimulant class medications are the treatment of choice, um, period. Um, not much quibbling about that. But for parents and families, it's the exact opposite. Usually, uh, the decision to try medication has come only after years of trying other things, soul searching. It's usually the treatment of last resort for most families. This notion that uh, you'll hear out there that uh, parents are eager to put their children on medication and these are just lazy parents and nonsense like that, uh, I've never seen that happen. Uh, it's usually something that has only been come to uh, after years of trying other things and basically not having anything work adequately. The standard of care uh, is to start with the stimulant medications unless there's a real good reason not to. Uh, we use the word stimulant uh, because that's the easiest thing to measure. Uh, there are a lot of questions as to whether that's really how and why these medications work. What we do know is that when you have the right molecule at the right dose, you should not have any side effects, that these medications are returned to normative functioning. They don't produce an artificial state. While we have 22 and soon to be 23 and 24 brand name products out there, they're all just different ways of delivering only two molecules. We have the methylphenidate group, which is Ritalin, Concerta, Focalin, Methylin, and all of those. We have the amphetamine group, which is Vyvanse, Adderall, Adderall, Xar, Dexedrine, etc. Uh, these medications have been on the market for a long, long time. Amphetamine came on the market in 1887. Methylphenidate became available in 1939. In other words, longer than most of us have been alive. So these are extremely well-known, safe medications that have been studied um, for, in some cases, more than 100 years. Everybody is going to have a preference for one over the other. Somebody's really going to like an amphetamine delivery system. Somebody's re somebody else is really going to like methylphenidate. Nothing that anybody's found predicts that in advance. You just have to try both of them. And as far as anybody can tell, it doesn't run in families. So one kid may be on amphetamine, another kid may be on methylphenidate, and the parent be on something else entirely. So again, it's one of those things that unfortunately is kind of trial and error. But we're really not in the dark that much. Uh, the way you fine tune the medication is toward target symptoms. What is it about the ADHD that's actually getting in your way or your child's way of being the person that you know you can be? Uh, just about every kid, an adult with ADHD, is, quote, not living up to their potential. The ADHD is tremendously impairing in every area of their life. 
So what you do is you list the things like not being able to pay attention in, in class, having a poor memory, not being able to remember what you read, procrastination, whatever it happens to be for that unique individual. And that's how you grade the medication. How well does the medication get rid of uh, those symptoms? Dr. What Doctor, if I could just interrupt there. One question that's come up frequently is people, folks asking whether um, a specific medication is better for certain kinds of ADD. So is there a medication that's better for inattentive ADD versus hyperactivity? Is there a medication that works better for uh, postmenopausal women? I mean, these are, these are a few of the questions that I have seen. Sure. And the answer is nobody knows. That has been a um, topic of a great deal of research over the last 25 years. And in large groups, there is nothing that would lead you or your clinician to choose amphetamine over methylphenidate or one delivery system over another. In large groups, they're pretty much equal in their effectiveness, in their side effect profiles, um, the whole bit. In a unique individual, however, there is a clear preference and a very clear right molecule and dose. So um, you just have to try both of them. Your expectations should be fairly high. In medicine, we're always very concerned about uh, what treatment does work best for this unique patient. And we measure that in terms of effect size. And it's always a ratio, how well does this treatment work as compared to this other one. The uh, medications for ADHD, the first-line medications, uh, are really some of the most effective medications in all of medicine. Just about everything in medicine, whether it's a medi uh, medication, a surgical procedure, or whatever, falls in the range of 0.4 to 1.0. The stimulant medications, if you operate within that very narrow range of doses is approved by the FDA come in at uh, 1.0. In other words, some of the most effective medications around. If you allow yourself to go both to lower doses than are FDA approved and higher doses than FDA approved, you get uh, an effect size in excess of two. The newer alpha agonist medications, uh, when they work, come in at an effect size of 1.3. So these are quite literally some of the most effective treatments in medicine. And so you really shouldn't stop until you have a level of response that is truly life-changing. Dr. Dawson, how do you suggest um, that people work their way through this, this question of the right medicine and the right, right dose? It seems to be a very difficult and universal problem for, for, for people. Um, you know, they, that many people stop have side effects that they that are unacceptable, um, and they stop medication, and they just they don't find they're not able to work through and figure out a medication that does work for them. Is there a percent of people for whom they don't work? Also, I guess yes. would be a specific question. If you took a large group of people with ADHD, you're pretty sure yes, they have ADHD. That's not something else. And you tried whichever medication the doc was feeling lucky with that day, say it was methylphenidate, 70% of people are going to have this, oh, wow, where have you been all my life type response. But that means that 30% will not. They'll either have no response at all or they'll feel mildly icky. Uh, if you use the other molecule, amphetamine, about 70% will respond with that, oh, wow, where have you been all my life. But it's a different 70%. When both medications are tried, uh, and this is when you lump all the studies together, 88% of people will get a very robust response to one molecule over the other. Um, having side effects is nature's way of telling you the dose is too high. Uh, remember that um, when we talk about approved dosages, these are merely the dosages that the FDA studied. It is not what dose may be right for you. So that somewhere between 8 and 10% of people get, get their optimal response at doses lower than the lowest dose manufactured. So if you or your child started off on the very lowest dose and immediately had side effects, go down on the dose. 
So starting at a low dose, is it, the lowest possible dose is the best strategy? Yes. Yeah. Always start at the lowest possible dose. And that, again, that's going to be different for every uh, product that's out there. Uh, but again, of somewhere around one in every ten people, that lowest dose is already going to be too high. So you need to go down on the dose. Conversely, uh, if you lump together the 20 studies that have allowed themselves to go beyond the FDA, quote, maximum, what they found is that 40% of children, adolescents, and adults optimize at doses higher than the highest dose uh, FDA approved. So what you have is the FDA range of approved dosages only covers about 50% of patients. 10% are going to be lower, 40% are going to be higher. The thing to remember is that if you're having side effects, the dose, except at the very end, we'll talk about rebound later, if you're having side effects, it's the wrong molecule, or more commonly, the dose is too high. At the right molecule and dose, this is a return to normative functioning and no side effects. Well, there's a question here from um, a person named Tara who's, who's asking, um, what medication can you recommend that does not have the side effect of tics or aggression? My son has developed both of these. Um, Concerta works best for his ADHD, but he has tics. And he's, he's nine years old. We've tried Vyvanse and Intuniv and Adderall, but they don't work for his ADHD. In a, okay. case, in a case like that, is that a situation then of okay. Wait, too high a dose? All right. This is a good example where this is a kid who's responding to methylphenidate, getting a good response there, and not to amphetamine. So that you're going to be using a product somewhere in the methylphenidate range. Uh, ticks are one of the more common and distressing um, things that emerge with um, ADHD treatment. The, the medications, the ADHD medications, don't cause ticks. They may elicit a tick for which there's already a biologic predisposition. Indeed, many of these kids already had ticks before the medication was started. And again, this is a place where uh, the research literature and what people actually experience are diametrically opposite. If you look in the research literature, stimulants don't make, uh, stimulant medications don't make ticks worse. In fact, uh, eight times out of ten, uh, it makes them better. But family is no different. Uh, they see it in their own kid. So uh, when do you think about treating um, a, a tick? Well, you, it's when it's causing a problem with performance out in school and stuff like that, or when it becomes embarrassing. Uh, minor little ticks that only mom would notice, you leave alone. The first thing to do is to take caffeine out of the diet. The most potent trigger of ticks known to man is simple caffeine, which unfortunately right now is very popular with teenagers in the form of uh, Red Bull Monster and stuff like that. 50% of ticks will go away if you take caffeine out of the diet. Uh, the caffeine alone wasn't enough to trigger the tick. Uh, the ADHD medication alone wasn't, but the two of them together actually produces a significant tick. Uh, the next thing that is recommended actually helps the ADHD. The uh, first treatment of choice uh, after removing caffeine uh, is uh, to try the other molecule. There's what they call the rule of 40. Uh, if you have a side effect on one molecule, 40% of the time, you won't have it on the other one. So if the kid's on methylphenidate uh, and he's having a tick, move him to amphetamine and vice versa. And that's going to fix it 40% of the time. When you start adding medications, the first thing to try are the so-called alpha agonist medications, which are very good medications uh, for ADHD all by themselves. They are FDA approved uh, for the treatment of ADHD, both as standalone medications and in conjunction with a stimulant. So you're going to be getting uh, a twofer, a treatment of the tick and an improvement uh, of the uh, ADHD. Uh, the original molecules, uh, clonidine and guanfacine, were brought on the market in 1980. Uh, so again, we've had 30 years worth of experience with these medications. Uh, they were very difficult to tolerate originally, uh, but in the last two years, uh, they brought out extended release formats 
under the brand name of Intuniv, I-N-T-U-N-I-V, or Capvay, K-A-P-V-A-Y, which makes these medications much more effective and much more tolerable. So that's the first thing that most people will try just because it improves everything. If that doesn't work, what most docs will try is one of the atypical neuroleptics. And the medication that has by far the most positive research is a medication called Risperdal. Uh, and it's uh, twin sort of twin sister uh, called uh, Zepravidone. Uh, and your, your pediatrician should know these medications. And again, at very low dosages. Uh, these medications are very low in side effects, uh, especially in low dose, uh, and in head-to-head -head studies have proven themselves to be as effective as the big gun medications that have been used for decades, the what, call, what are called typical neuroleptics, things like Haldol and Temozide that have lots of side effects and perhaps permanent uh, uh, neurological dystonias and stuff like that. So usually uh, if somebody's going to go beyond one of these brand new, not brand new, very new uh, uh, atypical neuroleptics, you're going to need to go to a pediatric neurologist for that. That's going to be out of the league of me and most pediatricians. So it's uh, get caffeine out of the diet, try switching molecules, and alpha agonist and then uh, one of the atypicals, and the one that has the best track record is Risperidol, Risperidone. Thank you. Um, a question now about um, ADHD in conjunction with anxiety. Um, this this uh, mother thinks that perhaps her um, ADHD child's anxiety is um, exacerbated by stimulant medication. So that's one question, can stimulant medication cause or exacerbate anxiety? And then another question, which has also been raised, is um, in cases where you do have anxiety or depression plus ADHD, in what order are those treated, and, and how do those medications work together? Okay. As with everything in, in medicine, you need to have the right diagnosis first. Uh, John Rady, uh, driven to distraction fame, published an article 15 years ago now uh, pointing out that um, most people with ADHD had what he called dyslexithymia, which again is a fancified word uh, meaning using the wrong word for feelings. So when somebody comes in they, and they're talking about they have ADHD and they're uh, talking about feeling anxious, the first thing I ask them is, can you tell me more about your baseless apprehensive fear? And I can tell you that about nine times, that, that's the definition of anxiety, by the way, is baseless, apprehensive fear. So it's fear. It's yes. About being afraid. You, you have to have a fear that something awful is about to happen. I can tell you that nine times out of ten, I get a quizzical look about, what are you talking about? I never said I was afraid. And I said, well, forget the label. Tell me what you experience. And again, nine times out of ten, what I get is, I'm always tense, I can never relax, I can't just sit there and watch a TV program with the rest of the family, I can't turn my brain and body off to go to sleep at night, I'm very sensitive to my perception that other people disapprove of me, uh, it makes me very fearful in um, uh, personal interactions, that sort of thing. So what they're really doing is they're describing the inner experience of being hyperactive or hyper aroused and they're just putting the wrong label on it. So again, most important thing is make sure that you are indeed uh, treating anxiety and not versus the hyperarousal of ADHD. I think that this is why when you, again, look at the five studies that are uh, published on children with both ADHD and anxiety, uh, all five of them show that if anything, the anxiety gets better. And I think it's because they didn't make that distinction. Uh, what they saw was, yes, the hyperactive component got better. And so um, they, what they thought they were seeing was anxiety when really it was hyperactivity. Remember that most kids after age uh, 14 don't show that much overt hyperactivity. But it's still there if you ask, for, ask about it. 
What do you mean it's still there if you ask about it? Um, so they're not they're not racing around the classroom, but there's still a sense of, of right. Um, why don't we talk about um, when do you add this second class, the alpha agonist medications? Because all the uh, standards of care say you get that stimulant right if you possibly can. 12% of people are not going to get a good response to either amphetamine or methylphenidate. But let's talk about the 88% that do. How do you decide whether or not uh, to try to add on a second medication? And often this is as big a discussion and uh, period of uh, angst as the original decision to try the stimulants. Uh, one simple question that a five-year-old can answer is, you know, the kid, the kid is on a really good stimulant. You ask him, how many thoughts do you have on your uh, mind right now? Um, what most kids, even on a finely tuned stimulant, will say, I still have four or five. It's better than it was. I used to have 20, but I'd still have four or five. Imagine as an adult what it would be like for you to have four or five people constantly talking to you. It would, uh, that in and of itself would be highly distracting. And so these are the people who are going to need um, an, another medication. The stimulants are great for performance enhancement. How is the kid doing in school? How is the parent doing in work and in taking care of the family? But the stimulants are not that good with dealing with either impulsivity or the hyperactive component of ADHD. And for that, traditionally, we have added these alpha agonist medications. Interesting. Uh, to that point, um, we do have a question from someone who asks whether stimulant medications affect motivation and responsibility and um, issues beyond focus. She said, you know, what, what, what can, can, here's a quote exactly. Can medication help motivation or responsibility? My son isn't motivated by school, but rather by his social life. Will a pill really make him more motivated or more responsible? The answer is no. Mm -hmm. uh, what the medications do is once you do get engaged with something, it keeps you from being distracted. But it doesn't help you get engaged to begin with. If you look at that child, he will get engaged with things in his life on the basis of only four factors. He will do it when he's interested or intrigued by what he's doing. He'll do it when he's challenged or competitive. He'll do it so long as the task is new, novel, creative, but that one's time limited. And he'll do it when it's urgent, right at the do or die deadline. Non-ADHD people will be motivated uh, and uh, help them choose what to do for three other factors. The neurotypical non-ADHD person will do it because it's important, there's a reward for doing it, there's a consequence if you don't do it. So I would bet that this mom has found that rewards don't do it, uh, taking stuff away from him doesn't do it, um, and certainly her sense of importance, secondhand importance, doesn't lead him to get engaged and get access to really what is a very fine intellect. So again, the ADHD nervous system is very different from the neurotypical nervous system. Interesting. Um, question from two people and sort of variations, one from Herb and adult. Is it a good or bad idea to um, stop taking Vyvanse once in a while? to take a break. And similarly, um, from a parent, um, and another one from a school psychologist, um, my doctors frequently advise a uh, weekend and summer holiday vacation from medication. Is this a good idea? The answer is no, it's not a good idea. Um, th this comes from uh, somebody who hasn't read a journal since 1970. Um, back then, uh, a guy named Saver uh, in order to scare people off of taking medication, uh, published some data about uh, ADHD medications causing growth retardation. Uh, and again, it took 25 years to watch a group of kids grow all the way up and find out that you know it really didn't exist. Uh, everybody attained their full predicted height and weight. Uh, but uh, there was this recommendation of taking kids off so they could catch up. What they found was it made no difference. 
Uh, about 6% of people with ADHD have what's called a sawtooth growth curve. They stop growing for a while, then they have compensatory growth. They stop growing, have compensatory growth, et cetera, rather than that nice smooth growth curve. But it had nothing to do with the medication. So, uh, what also, when I people report that their child has, de people definitely report that their child you know, doesn't eat well okay. until that's, medication that's something else off. entirely. Which so that's the question of that is, that is the number one question, which we will handle in just one second. Okay. Um, the whole notion of taking the medication, most pediatricians look at ADHD as a school problem. And to this day, 70% of pediatricians only prescribe the medication Monday through Friday, 7 to 3. ADHD is how you're wired. It's your nervous system 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. And this notion that you can take holidays, I hate that word, holidays, um, leaves the very strong impression that taking the medication at all is optional. Uh, that you can take it or not, it's not that important whether you take it or not. What we found is that people who don't take their medication are at tremendous risk of school failure. They have a 400% increase in severe accidents, a 400% increase in developing a substance use uh, diagnosis, a, a tenfold increase in unplanned out of wedlock pregnancy, a doubling of the rate of divorce. I mean, you look at any aspect of human existence and it's made worse by untreated ADHD. So I don't recommend um, anybody going off the medication as a, quote, holiday. Now, the, the thing is that the medications work equally well because they get in and at one hour what you see is what you get. You can take them intermittently, but I certainly don't recommend that for uh, anybody um, that's, say, under the age of 21. You need real consistency. Now, that's really what we're looking for in the medication of ADHD is to help the person be consistent, reliable, predictable, and having the medication sometimes and not others really undermines that most fundamental goal of treatment. So uh, let's talk about appetite suppression. About 30% of parents will report appetite suppression with these medications. And it's the only side effect that's not dose-related. Uh, only about 6%, however, is it going to be something that has clinical significance. The child's not gaining weight, they're not growing, uh, that sort of thing. Or they're actually losing weight. Uh, and almost always, it's the 6% of kids who are already real thin, picky eaters. Uh, I've never seen appetite suppression happen to a chubby kid. Um, and so it really does threaten the uh, otherwise very workable um, therapy for the ADHD. I found that most ADHD families can't do the, you know, trying to off the medication, wedging in snacks in between doses and stuff like that. It's just too complicated. Uh, if you can do it, uh, more power to you. Uh, just most families can't. Uh, consequently, most families will add in one of two medications. 95% uh, of the time, appetite will be returned to normal with the use of a medica medication called ciproheptadine. Uh, when we were kids, it was a, uh, under the brand name of periactin. Ciproheptadine is C-Y-P-R-O-H-E-P-T-A-D-I-N-E. And it's a uh, antihistamine used for uh, preschoolers, little bitty kids. So it's very, very gentle. And it has the effect in 95% of people with ADHD of reversing the appetite suppression caused by uh, stimulant medications. And it does so without um, side effects. The lowest dose is 4 milligrams. And most little kids can take uh, half a tablet uh, before each meal. And you'll have an absolutely normal appetite. For the 5% who uh, don't get an absolutely normal appetite, uh, the medication to try is mirtazapine. Uh, it's an old uh, antidepressant. It was under the name of Remeron. And mirtazapine is M-I-R-T-A-Z-E-P-I-N-E. -E. 
it's an unusual medication in that the lower the dose, the greater the side effects. And one of the side effects is it really stimulates appetite. So you use the lowest dose, 15 milligrams, break it in half, you give it once at night. And the whole rest of the day, um, the, uh, the appetite's normal uh, the whole next day. And that, that will work virtually 100% of the time, but it can get out of hand and, and actually cause weight gain. So it does need to be fine-tuned. But between those two medications, uh, I've never found anybody I couldn't get back to a normal appetite. So, so again, go talk to your pediatrician about that. Right. The treatment for the appetite loss then is not necessarily changing the, medic the ADHD medication or the dose? Or is that again, the first it's, line? Again, 40, the 40% 40 rule is that if you change molecules 40% of the time, whatever the uh, side effect is will go away. But say, okay. you know, you've found which molecule and you're still, you know, works best and you're having appetite suppression, then adding on one of these very simple, safe, well-known uh, medications that have virtually no side effects um, uh, really uh, reverses that very nicely and immediately. You see the benefit in an hour. Interesting. Okay. Um, I have some questions about um, sort of life cycle issues. The first part of the question is, what is a safe age at which to start medication? What's the minimum age that's recommended for children on ADHD medication? And then it, the second one is, a part, second part of that is, when kids go through puberty, are they likely to, is that likely to affect the medication, the dosage? The, um, the kind of medication or the dosage that's effective for them? Okay. Uh, there are no recommendations from in the national, national and international standards of care on age. Uh, the recommendation is according to impairment. It's, is the child impaired by their ADHD? So the typical thing that you hear is, this is a three-year-old kid, um, either it's a single parent or both parents have to work. It's not a choice. They have to work. And the kid's been thrown out of his third daycare center. Um, this is a family that's in crisis. And you know that at least one of the parents has ADHD. That's where the, you know, the average pediatrician is going to take a real deep breath and treat the ADHD. I have never met a pediatrician who is happy to start at that age. And, again, what they're doing is they're doing it to save a family. And so um, remember that ADHD uh, can be highly impairing, not just to the kid, but to the whole family. Or you have a kid who's dangerously daring. This is a kid, if you don't watch him, is jumping off the roof, that sort of thing. So with that level of impairment, you're going to think about medication much earlier. Uh, what determines the dose is not age, gender, scale scores, weight, uh, nothing uh, predicts dose. Uh, when you see so many milligrams per kilogram per day, that actually comes from research, and it was there to protect the double blind. It, it kept the researchers blind to how much medication was being given. Um, what determines the dose of any medication is how efficiently it's absorbed out of the GI tract. So that's what causes these tremendous ranges of doses, you know, from 10% of people who are responding to very low doses to 40% of people to very high doses. It's not what you swallow, it's what's absorbed. And that varies. It goes both up and down uh, in children up until about the 16th birthday. So all of the standards of care say the uh, dose needs to be reevaluated about once a year. Most of the time it's done in August, right before the school uh, year starts, but with the notion that it can go down just as often as up. So just because Junior's put on 40 pounds and is now playing football and he's three inches taller, don't expect that the dose absolutely will go up. There's just as good a chance that it'll go down. So you have to re-titrate the dose. I have a number of questions from people who, who say something along these lines. Um, this is about a child, but we also have adults with a similar question. Um, my son's 12. He's in the sixth grade. He's a very bright kid, definitely in trouble academically. Um, he's been diagnosed with ADHD since second grade, and we've tried a variety of different medications over the years, both stimulant and non-stimulant, and we've yet to see any significant help from them. He's currently on Intuitive, Zoloft, and Bupropion. 
Bupropion. Um, bupropion. And what do you do when the medication doesn't help? Okay. Yeah, as I, we have tried Adderall, Stratera, and Detrana. So here's a situation where, um, and again, as I said, there are a couple of similar questions at different age ranges of people who are currently on some set of medications have tried others but don't feel that they've gotten any help. Right. Uh, you would think that something that happened to 12%, one in every eight people, there would be lots and lots of research out there about what to do. There's absolutely nothing. Zip. Um, and so that, that's my way of saying this is going to be going off the reservation in a big hurry. Uh, there, um, th this is what very experienced clinicians will do. Um, the first thing they'll, they'll do is they'll make sure that when the methylphenidate and amphetamine trials were done, that the uh, family avoided citric acid and vitamin C. Um, both amphetamine and methylphenidate are uh, very strong bases. If they're present in the GI tract where they're you know, waiting to be absorbed with either citric acid, the most commonly used preservative uh, in the United States, or ascorbic acid, vitamin C, it precipitates the medication out of solution. It can't be absorbed. And all you get out of that dose is high-octane poop. So for an hour before or after the dose, um, you have to avoid foods that contain citric acid or vitamin C, which means virtually every fruit juice, even apple and grape juice, have citric acid added to it as a preservative. Uh, any artificial um, juices like Gatorade, Tang, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, all sodas, uh, with but four exceptions, classic Coke, uh, A&W brand root beer, and regular and diet Dr. Pepper. Um, Pop-Tarts, granola bars, anything that comes in a foil package and can sit on the shelf for years uh, without being cooked um, has to have lots of citric acid in it. And finally, of course, um, vitamins. You know, a lot of parents will give, you know, the gummy vitamin right, right along with their uh, Ritalin, and uh, that sabotages the Ritalin. Um, so you, you can have all these things just not an hour before or after the dose. So if you've tried that and they still don't work, you just don't see anything. You don't see benefits, but you also don't see side effects. Um, then what most people will do is they'll go to one of these alpha agonists, and that's what this family has done. Uh, they've gone to Intuniv. And you, you fine-tune into it as best you can. Um, is it possible that the diagnosis is wrong in a case like this? It, it, is, it is possible that the diagnosis is wrong. But that's usually the first thing that most docs are going to go back is, back let me it. make sure that I've got the right diagnosis. Right. And that, with, with all of these things, assume that the physician is going back and said, do I have the right diagnosis? Wow. Okay. Uh, Here's another, um, another question about about the issue of diagnosis. Um, this is a parent who says, um, I think my son has ADHD. He definitely has executive functioning problems that have turned our household into a battle zone. Um, what do I do to get an accurate um, diagnosis? What I don't want to have happen is to have someone just sort of listen to the description and then prescribe medication. I'm, I'm happy to go to medication if it's really on the basis of a comprehensive evaluation but I'm not sure how to get that evaluation or to find a medical, the right medical professional to do it. Uh, that is the very first hurdle that just about everybody has to go through. Uh, one of the great leaders in, in our field is a guy named Peter Jensen. He's currently at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, about a year and a half ago, he published an article uh, to the effect that the average family went through 11 clinicians before they found one that they had confidence in to treat their child. Uh, American medical education generally ignores ADHD uh, in children and it completely does in adults. Uh, most adult uh, practitioners, psychiatrists or otherwise, um, have never had so much as a minute's instruction about ADHD. So the place to start is with your local CHAD chapter, or if you're an adult, your local NADDA, the National Attention Deficit Disorder Association. Uh, and you can find these um, on the web, chad, C-H-A-D-D dot org, or A-D-D dot org. Um, and uh, go to the meetings. Talk to people about who 
uh, is good, who takes the time, who answers your questions, who's thoughtful about it, who looks for other things that might be going on. Um, be aware that your managed care insurance uh, wants all this to be done in 12 minutes. Uh, and anybody who tries to do it in 12 minutes is going to get a bad outcome. So be prepared when you're going to somebody for this initial evaluation uh, to pay a little bit more out of pocket. Uh, but it's worth it because it's, it's where you're starting. And so make sure that you do have the right diagnosis uh, and make sure that you have all of the diagnoses. For instance, in this particular case, um, they describe the house as being like a battleground. Remember that somewhere around 30 to 40 percent of boys with ADHD are also going to carry a, another diagnostic label called oppositional defiant disorder. Uh, and it's basically, again, another genetic, hardwired, neurological um, problem in which people with ODD, oppositional defiant disorder, uh, are hardwired to thwart whoever they perceive as being the authority figure. And it can just tear families apart. So make sure you have all of the diagnoses. In the case of oppositional defiant disorder, that presumably is not treated with medication. Actually, it is. Um, not in the United States. So here in the United States, we tend to be a very judgmental and punitive people. Um, oppositional defiant, defiant disorder is uh, basically conceptualized as being bad kids, bad parents, or both. Uh, everywhere else in the world, it's recognized to be a genetic disorder. Uh, it runs in families. Uh, and it has a biologic marker. Uh, people who have oppositional defiant disorder don't have metabolites of serotonin in their cerebral spinal fluid. And about 70% of these people get a very good response uh, to one of the atypical neuroleptics, again, the medications that were uh, being used to treat ticks, uh, also can have a very dramatic effect on oppositional defiant disorder. So again, it's one of those things where you need to take some time, go to a, um, somebody who's really an expert and who is also going to be reading the literature from Europe. Interesting. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Um, this is a mom of two boys with severe combined ADHD, and she says, I need help with unmedicated mornings. These are school mornings where I get the two boys, no meds yet in their systems, ready for the bus. The younger boy is unfocused, daydreaming, and wasting time, and the older boy is, um, until his meds kick in, he just can't sit still, dancing around, making loud noises. I could um, spend all morning running back and forth between the two of them to make sure they're still following their morning routine, but I'm exhausting myself. What could help? Okay. There are two things that parents do. Uh, one of them is what's called a two-alarm system, uh, where... You have to get up an hour before they do and give them their medication, have them go right back to sleep so that when the real alarm goes off, um, you, they're at peak blood level and you don't have this. Um, but it requires you to get up an hour earlier. Um, if you know, you're the parent with ADHD and you're having trouble getting up yourself and getting organized, uh, a two-alarm system may be uh, helpful for you as well. The only other thing that has been found to work is using a product like Daytrona, which is a uh, transdermal patch uh, that delivers methylphenidate. Again, the FDA only approves it for nine hours of wear time, uh, but it was originally developed uh, for 24 hours of wear time. And so you can just put on a new patch every 24 hours. Again, that's... Um, uh, something that you need to talk with your pediatrician about, but again, the person's on medication 24 hours a day that way. Interesting. But those two things work very well. Um, that's great. Um, question about generic medications. Um, our daughter is ADD and attentive, was just prescribed Concerta, and I'm wondering after this, after a lengthy conversation with the pharmacist, um, whether gen the I opted for the generics, and I'm wondering whether I made the right decision. Okay. Is there a difference between the two? The, um, the two generics, uh, one for uh, Concerta 
and the other one for Adderall XR uh, have every appearance of being excellent products. Uh, and I freely substitute them. Um, what makes a generic a generic is that it has exactly the same medication in it, but its quality control is what varies. Uh, if you have a brand name, Concerta, it is, and it says 36 milligrams, it's 36 milligrams within 1%. It's exactly 36 milligrams. Um, a generic product can vary 25% high or low. So say you just get methylphenidate 20 milligrams, you don't know whether you're getting 15 or all the way up to 25, and it varies from pill to pill to pill. So if, if the child is not particularly sensitive to dose, that can be okay. But most people are very sensitive to dose, and so, again, it's, it, they're all over the place. Some days the medication works better than others because, again, of that tremendous variation in the generic. So um, you just have to try it to see. Unfortunately, a lot of times there will be multiple generics, and you get a different one each time you fill the prescription. So when I'm starting off with somebody, I always use brand name medications to make sure that we've really fine-tuned the dose, and then we do an experiment about whether this person can tolerate a generic. Interesting. Uh, many people cannot. Right, because the dose is so specific to, to right. the person. Right. Yeah, many people um, can tell the difference of two milligrams high or low. Wow, incredible. Um, there's a question about insomnia, which is also comes up a lot. We know at Attitude that articles about insomnia are among the most sought after and popular of the, the articles on our website. This is uh, my 14-year-old son's been taking ADHD medication for several years. It's been very effective for him. Since he started high school, he's becoming, uh, he's found it more and more difficult to fall asleep at night. Um, should we think about changing his ADHD medications? Uh, no, is the answer. Um, way, way back when, when I was first starting my training, I was taught that ADHD went away in adolescence because the hyperact, uh, hyperactive component of ADHD really dimmed in adolescence. But the hyperactivity doesn't go away. It goes internally and it shifts to the nighttime and presents as insomnia. So it's very, very common to hear people in their mid-adolescent years have trouble turning off their brains and bodies to go to sleep at night. Uh, and this gets progressively worse until a person's about 20, 21. Uh, there are two very good studies out of the Netherlands that show that the sleep disturbance of ADHD is as impairing as the rest of ADHD put together. Um, the average adult with ADHD spends two hours every night trying to fall asleep. Uh, so what you do is you fine tune a stimulant, uh, the right molecule, the right dose. And then on a day when you can, a Saturday or Sunday after lunch, lie down and take a nap. Prove to yourself that these medications help you clear your mind, relax, slow down, calm down. And since most people with ADHD are sleep deprived anyway, about 95% of people find that they can nap sometimes for the first time in their life while they're on their stimulant medication. At that point, you can then add on a second dose of medication. It really covers your entire working day and will help you fall asleep at night. I know that that sounds utterly wacky, uh, that you give, quote, a stimulant um, to, to go to sleep with. But again, remember one of the fundamental principles is if you have the right molecule and the right dose, there is no stimulation. And what you see is a return to normative functioning. And that means normal sleep as well. Interesting. A question about that second dose. Um, there's a... Um one of our viewers here's daughter takes Concerta. She says it's quite effective for her, but it, it wears off by, by 3 or 4 o'clock after school. And she's wondering, you know, can she take another extended release Concerta at that point in the day, which I think her pediatrician doesn't seem enthusiastic about. Okay. The FDA does not allow the drug companies to even test twice-a-day dosing. 
Um, so any twice a day dosing is going to be off label and not that there's anything wrong with it, but just that the FDA has certain fixed beliefs about these medications that aren't true. Um, the notion that any ADHD medication with the exception of Detrana is a 24 hour or once a day medication is utter nonsense. Um, in fact, most of them don't get the 12 hours that they promise. Uh, such as this particular person with Concerta is not getting 12 hours out of the dose. Um, for a unique individual, you'll get the same duration of action, but it'll be unique to you as an individual. So what we do is you find the right molecule, you figure out the very lowest dose that gives you optimal performance, you figure out how long that's lasting, you then take a nap to prove that a second dose is actually going to improve your sleep at night, and then you can take a second dose uh, with the confidence that it's not going to cause any problems at night. And what it will do is it will help the kid with uh, homework, with better behavior uh, after school, uh, with safer driving for the older adolescent. Uh, there's nothing but positives to be gained by a second dose. Interesting. Would that be a shorter acting dose then? I guess it depends on the person. And um, I, I do exactly the same dose in an extended release product. Uh, I don't use uh, immediate release medications unless I just necessarily have to for financial reasons. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, this is a nursing mother who asks, is, are you aware of any medication that could be safely taken for ADD for an ADD mother who has a toddler still breastfeeding a couple of times a day? Um, I'm hoping to find something I can take in the morning that's short-acting um, when my daughter's not likely to nurse and um, so that she doesn't nurse until the medication is safely out of my system. Okay. Uh, there is no research published on that. Mm -hmm. uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics um, says don't nurse, and but they, uh, if you're taking stimulant medications or don't take stimulant medications if you're nursing, one or the other. But they also are very emphatic about uh, the fact that this is just because they don't know. It's not that there have been any problems reported with it. Uh, in fact, um, all of the ADHD medications, whether they're methylphenidate, amphetamine, the quote stimulants, or the alpha agonists are category C in uh, pregnancy, which means that the FDA allows their use in all three uh, trimesters of pregnancy. I think that's a very good indication of just how safe these medications are. And anybody who you know has worries about, well, we don't know what these medications are doing to a developing nervous system, the answer is yes, we do. Uh, and these are very old medications. We do have experience with them in all three uh, trimesters of pregnancy, and there just doesn't seem to be any problems. So based on that, I know a lot, I tell my um, patients that, you know, it, it's a decision for them. There's no known risk to breastfeeding, but, you know, there's no decision in life that doesn't carry some risk with it. So it's a question of this person's impairment. Yeah, their, their comfort with it. There's right. no known risk, but the emphasis on the word known. Right. Um, uh, medications like str Stratera, the non-stimulants, this is a question, and there are a number of, about these medications. Um, this, this parent, Brenda, says, it helps with my child's emotions, but it, is it really appropriate? Does it, can it really help with attention, with focus? I'm not sure what she means by emotions, but... Um, Stratera is a second or third line drug. In both the United States and in Europe, uh, they, the people who do the um, standards of care created a third line category so they would have some place to put Stratera. Uh, it do, and simply put, it doesn't work nearly as well as the other medications do. Again, if you go back to that notion of effect size, uh, the very best effect size that they've ever been able to get for Stratera is 0.7. Um, um, and with um, you know, the stimulants being somewhere but uh, up to as much as two. Uh, 
it loses its effectiveness the older you get so that with late adolescents and adults, the uh, best effect size they've been able to find is 0.44, which is barely detectable. So it is not a first line, many people would say it's not even a second line medication. Um, now every once in a while, once in every 200 people, you're going to find somebody who gets a wonderful response. And I'm very glad that that happens, but that's not to be expected. Mm -hmm. um, Proterra is very much a second-line medication. The thing about mood is that the company um, pointed out that this that Stratera is actually a derivative of, or uh, very similar in its structure to Prozac. Uh, and they touted it as having effects for both depression and anxiety, despite the fact that they had six studies to show that it didn't. So uh, these medications, while the drug company uh, is now appropriately in a lot of trouble with the FDA about this. There's no evidence to say that these medications help either depression or anxiety. Okay. All right. What are your thoughts about, quote, recovering drug addicts diagnosed with ADHD and medication? Specifically, I'm working with an adolescent who has ADHD, and when she went into a treatment center for addiction, she was told that she could never use Vyvanse again. Is there research that supports this approach? The answer is no. There's no research to, to support that. There's a fairly slim uh, research, um, uh, six uh, very large studies done, uh, all of them open label, so there's no double blind control. But what they found was that uh, treating the ADHD with stimulant medications did nothing. It uh, didn't help the recovery, didn't hurt it. Uh, the medications, believe it or not, were not abused. Uh, again, because most people know that if you exceed the dose even a little bit, it's unpleasant. I mean, what we've been talking about is all the side effects that come if you go just a little bit too high. So the evidence is that um, it neither helps nor hurts. Interesting. I guess we're pretty much out of time here. It's a question about um, whether fish oils can help um, when taken in conjunction with ADHD medication. There's this considerable interest in homeopathic remedies, um, for, for especially by parents whose children are not able to tolerate stimulants. The, the standard sort of encyclopedia on ADHD is a book, again, by Peter Jensen, uh, where he's the editor of it. It's called ADHD State of the Science Best Practices and it's a review of the 87,000 pieces of research um, that have been published on ADHD up until the time the book was published. And Chapter 13 was done by uh, Gene Arnold at the University of Ohio on all of these uh, things other than medication, standard medications. And what they found is nothing works. Um, the, there is one uh, open label study out of Chicago that shows that um, omega threes had a very modest improvement. Uh, again, an effect size somewhere around 0 0.4, 0 0.5, which means barely detectable in some people. But that's about the extent of it. Uh, the fine gold diet, uh, fine gold laughed all the way to the bank on that one. Um, that's the uh, he had zero data. He just he just published a book about not giving your kids sugar. Um, but that has been disproven six times. Sugar has no effect on either making ADHD worse, better, or anything else. Um, there have been 60 double-blind control studies looking at what we eat. Uh, does that make any difference? And what they found is there's nothing that we eat that's been identified that can, one, cause ADHD, two, make it worse, or three, make it better. Um, there's just zero to, to make us think that that's the case. And uh, the neurofeedback retraining uh, and that sort of thing, CogMed, et cetera, again, lots of anecdotal stories, but in 35 years, not a single uh, double-blind controlled study to show that it has any effect whatsoever, either pro or con. And what about, you know, that we're commonly prescribed suggestion of making sure you get lots of protein if you are, have ADHD. So is that? And dietary 
um, uh, manipulations have not been shown to have any effect one way or the other. Okay. Um, yeah. Megavitamins has not been able to show. Again, I think it's it's two things. It shows the just discomfort that about a third of, of the population has with just any medication, not ADHD medications, but they just they don't like doctors, they don't like medications, uh, and they just you know they'd rather try anything else. Um, and the fact that these uh, concerns have been taken seriously. It's not that we've just blown them off. There's a mountain of research to look to see if there is anything. And as of today, um, there's absolutely nothing that anybody's found uh, that we can say uh, has, has shown detectable benefit. Interesting. So we, we take it very seriously. It's just we haven't found anything. Right. I think we're at the end. This has been really fascinating. I can't thank you enough for some, taking the time to answer. I wish, you know, we could answer all 500 questions that are here. And we will continue to provide information on these topics. It's really been helpful to have your input, Dr. Dotson. We're very grateful. Right. I've enjoyed it. Thank you for inviting me. Thanks. Thanks again. For more Attitude Podcast and information on living well with attention deficit, visit attitudemag.com. That's A-D-D-I-T-U-D-E-M-A-G dot com. 